COVID has brought to light one of the worst kept secrets of IT. Most of the budget, it doesn't go to sexy things like AI or creating the next IoT. It goes to maintaining legacy systems. Having started my career in IT services at a company that primarily maintained Fortune 500 legacy systems, it's been a unique experience to see news coverage, news coverage on state unemployment legacy systems. Not many people on Wall Street in 2009 would think that the back office to the back office legacy support teams would be the ones making the front page of national news ahead of IPOs, ahead of almost anything else that was going on. But we're here in 2020, where legacy systems are now news. Today's session is about how do we overcome our legacy burdens and how do we prepare for a world where we have to work with InsureTechs to transform the industry. On our agenda, you will see two TED style talks and two panels. You'll have the opportunity to hear from four core systems and platform providers and three carrier CIOs and chief digital officers who have led technology transformations in their organizations. And hopefully it will provide some level of confidence to those of you who got assigned the awful task of transforming your internal core systems to realize that it's not a career challenge, but it's a career opportunity. And that from the lessons in this session, hopefully you'll have the confidence and optimism to carry that with you back to your day job later today. I would like to thank our five sponsors for our event today. They've been very helpful to supporting our organization. First, Ernst & Young, who is helping insurers solve the toughest challenges and to realize their greatest ambitions by drawing on their shared creativity, experience, and diverse perspectives to reframe the future. Clarion Door, provider of breakthrough technology for digital insurance distribution. EIS, a platform of core systems and digital solutions that liberates insurers to accelerate and scale innovation launch products faster, and create insurance experiences the world will love. Guidewire, a platform for PNC insurers, trust, engage, innovate, and grow effectively. They combine digital core analytics and AI to deliver their platform as a cloud service. And Microsoft, last but not least, certainly, and as you'll hear, they're also a provider of our prize for networking today who is building the intelligent insurer of the future by delivering engaging customer experiences and improving operations through AI and advanced analytics. Now I will hand it over to our co-host, Brett Smith, one of the co-founders of InsureTech New York and LifeVest to uh, introduce. And before I do that, I would like to tell you about our two upcoming events. The first is on how to become an InsureTech unicorn. With the IPO of Lemonade, unicorns have become a new area of curiosity. The path to becoming an InsureTech unicorn is littered with many startup corpses, dating all the way back to the original technology boom in 2000. Yet in comparison with many other industries like consumer packaged goods or clean energy, the pandemic has strengthened InsureTech's relative position in vying for talent and VC funds. Learn from two unicorn founders, Asaf from Hippo and Max from States Title, about their journey and building their businesses. And trust me, it's going to be very exciting. And you can join the more than 300 people already registered for networking. Next is our October 29th event and the world's first InsureTech virtual matchmaking expo. For those of you who missed out on the opportunity to join the expo hall in ITC, we're going to have a virtual expo. One of the big challenges that we've heard from InsureTechs is the need to find talent to grow their companies. In the last five years, 
$20 billion or more has been invested in InsureTax and more than 4,000 InsureTax have been founded. If you're growing InsureTech looking to find advisors, board members, or full-time hires, consider a booth at our expo. If you're an insurance leader looking to expand your career and consider attending to find a startup you can advise, join their board, or a potential lateral clear move. Even if you're not out there looking to change careers, it's an exciting opportunity to learn about what InsureTechs are out there. For this event, we'll be using a new platform that combines a two-dimensional virtual world with virtual booths and networking in a virtual networking hall. We have very limited space on this and will likely sell out, so please register as soon as possible. Information for both events is available on our website, and we'll be sending more information shortly to you guys next week. And now I will pass it over to Brett Smith. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Um, we are going to kick things off today with our first TED Talk, Modern Legacy, The New Legacy, hosted by Anthony Grasso. Tony is the head of global marketing for EIS. EIS moves carriers closer to their customers with a cloud-enabled digital insurance platform to deliver fast, simple, and engaging experiences across the life cycle. Prior to EIS, Tony worked at the Hartford, leading innovation programs across the enterprise. I'll hand it over to you, Tony. Take it away. Okay. Okay, Tony Grasso, delighted to be here as part of this uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, talking about core systems evolution. We at EIS provide core technology built for the future of insurance. So I'm really going to talk about the evolution of core systems and what are the technologies that are we're evolving into that are going to take us from 2020 to 2030 and beyond. So insurance has disrupted. We all know that. That's why we're here. Uh, we, we are here to be part of the future of insurance, help design the future of insurance. Um, and you know, at last count, there's over 1,500 insure techs with over $4 billion in, in funding for startups, creating neo carriers, micro insurers, on-demand coverage, mobile-only carriers. The market is boiling over with new entrants, giving consumers the choice, speed, and simplicity that they demand. But this is creating a challenge for the traditional insurers who are really, unfortunately, unable to keep up. They're trying to get more agile, they're trying to get smaller, simpler, but for those legacy systems where 62% of insurance IT executives believe that legacy systems are their biggest obstacles to customer engagement. So Insurance technology has evolved and is resulting in a new form of legacy called modern legacy. This is the dangerous legacy that's hiding in plain sight. So there's the old legacy that we all know but don't love, the COBOL, the AS400, Oracle Forms, whatever the case may be. Uh, those systems had no chance of being digital. So digital systems were created on the side of those systems and operated completely independently. But then along came uh, modern legacy systems, systems that were designed just 10 years ago, not fully digital, uh, but did a nice job of putting a digital veneer on top, but they were still hindered by their monolithic architectures and product-centric business models. So not fully open or agile. The next generation of core systems technology is digital to the core. Everything that the system does is exposed to the outside world through APIs. And we believe that technology has shifted so far, leaving modern legacy behind. Why? Well, let's take a little walk through modern history. Let's go back to the early 2000s, around the 2000 timeframe, 2005 timeframe, when carriers were coming off of their COBOL and AS400 systems, right? Along came a whole new package of software, vendor technology, or commercial off-the-shelf. Uh, packages. Those systems were built 2005-2010 timeframe to solve the problems of those times on the technologies that were available during those times. But if we believe the industry has shifted so much so recently and that technology has shifted so much and so recently, why would we think that the systems that were built and designed in that timeframe are going to be a bit 
able to take us into the future, 2020s through 2030 and beyond. So it will enter a new breed of core systems built for the future of insurance, and we call that core tech. These systems are delivered in months, upgraded continuously, cloud native, and fully open and connect to the outside world. They're technologies that are required for the future of insurance 2020 and beyond because technology and expectation have sh shifted so much in just the past few years that modern legacy systems are now left behind and it's time for a new product category, core tech. And, and what does that category look like? Well, first off, it's customer-centered, truly digital, and allowing you as the carrier to use speed as your competitive weapon. So it starts with the customer at the center, customer-centric, not product-centric. Uh, it's the, the, the model is completely flipped. Because why? Because customers have products. Products don't have customers. It's really quite simple. So when you're customer-centric, you can use data as your oxygen to create ultra personalized offers that are relevant to that individual in the moments that matter, right? Allowing you to use data as your oxygen. And they're cloud native, truly digital, cloud native platforms, microservices, API first, so you can take true advantage of the cloud. Not some modern legacy enterprise system stuffed into the cloud, but a true cloud native platform is what's required. And then it's the technology tools and liberty methodologies of DevOps and low code and no code tooling that come together to allow you to use speed as your competitive weapon. So when you have a new coverage change, a new innovation that you wanna to get to the market, you could use speed as your competitive weapon and go faster than your competitors. And in this new world, and in order to thrive in this new world, insurance carriers need to enable three types of speed. speed. The first is speed to deploy. That's getting your system into production faster because the longer you take in that deployment process, the riskier and costlier the program becomes. Now, once you're in, in uh, production, it's speed to innovate. So getting your product ideas to market faster, getting your new innovations to market faster, your coverage changes into market faster, using speed as your competitive weapon. And then after you've been in production, after you've been innovating, launching new innovations, new products, it's speed to transform. Because in insurance is, is disrupting, is continuing to disrupt, where will you be in five years? What will you be selling? What will be important in five years? Uh, we don't know, right? Because it's disrupting. So you want a flexible platform that will allow you to be the insurer that you want to be, not the insurer that your core system forces you to be. And these systems, they have the right business model, customer centric, uh, that allow you to sell any product, any channel, with an open API base where you can connect to what you want to connect to, what is relevant to you and your customers, not what some vendor allows you to select to on, their, on a pre-chosen list of, of, of partners, right? Uh, this is the future of core systems. So let's break these down uh, one at a time uh, to show how Cortec delivers these competitive advantages of speed. And the first pillar is speed to deploy. So getting the software installed, because that first step is the riskiest step. Um, so in the modern legacy world, we're used to deployment projects that take 36 months, 24 months, even 18 months is, is too long in this, in this new world of, of innovation and evolution. And that's why CIOs have compared these deployments to open heart surgery. But with core, the new core tech technologies, it doesn't have to be that way, right? We're talking about core renewal that can be done in phases. We're talking about going live in months, not years, greatly reducing time, cost, and risk. We're talking about implementing in phases to get you value faster and reduce risk. Get to market faster, generate value faster, reduce risk. But it all requires the right technologies and the right approach. It requires cloud native technologies that are truly leveraged the power of the cloud, microservices for phased implementation, not monolithic, and a proven DevOps and CIC delivery method for agile. Now we get into speed to innovate. So now that you're deployed, how do you get your new products to market faster? How do you get your product changes to market faster? How do you get your innovations to market faster, right? So that you can use speed as your competitive weapon. So 
in the modern legacy world, we all know what uh, new product launches are right, are like, right? They're huge projects, long development cycles, uh, huge investments, creating this, this can't fail mentality. There's simply too much at risk with this waterfall approach. But with the new core tech technology, it doesn't have to be this way, right? We're talking about small iterative approaches. We're talking about being agile. We're talking about test and learn, taking small steps. We're talking about empowering your employees to make changes, not standing in line with IT. We're talking about embracing a fast fail mentality, uh, just like an insure tech does. So, right, but it requires the right technologies and the right approach. It requires an open API library to connect to anything. Uh, it requires low-code, no-code tooling, and it requires DevOps so that you're delivering changes to market agile and doing away with waterfall forever. And what does speed look like in this new world? So let me tell you what our customers, these are actual data that our customers are achieving with core tech technology, right? So customers who are in production with a product and they want to make a coverage change, uh, or they want to enter a new geography, a new state, or a new country. They can do this in one to two sprints. And so our customers are measuring delivery in sprints. And by a sprint, we're talking, we measure a sprint as every three weeks. So within just one to two change, uh, one to two sprints, sorry, they can get a product change in tested and in production. And when you look at the industry average, that's at least three months, right? Speed is your competitive weapon. Or with launching a new product, a new product to them, leveraging our pre-built library, right? Uh, they could do that in two to three sprints. And when you look at the industry average, that could, that's as uh, fast, that's as slow as eight months. So really we're talking, this is the new expectation that carriers should have when they talk about speed using the new evolving technologies of Cortex. So now the last pillar, speed to transform. You're in market, you're innovating, you're adding new products, it's several years out, and your journey as an insurance company is taking you to areas that you never thought uh, possible just five years ago, right? It's, insurance is changing that much. So how can you yourselves transform as an insurance business? So, and we all know the modern legacy world, right? There's an inability to move between channels and inability to move between lines of business because of the architectures of those modern legacy systems. They were built to solve different problems, the problems of yesterday, right? Product-centric, not customer-centric, monolithic, not microservices-based, right? And not really able to connect to the outside world because well, it just wasn't all that important back then. Right? But with Cortech, it's a frictionless journey, allowing you to build, deploy, and sell any product on any channel in any business model. But it requires the right technologies and the right approach. It requires a customer-centric architecture, not product-centric. It requires line-of-business agnostic product model. It's a mouthful, but it's really important. It means it's built for insurance, not built for a specific product or sector. Right? And it requires an agnostic business. Thanks for opening things up today. And it requires an agnostic business architecture, allowing you to sell B2C, B2B, B2B2C, all on the same platform. Allowing you to be the carrier that you want to be, not the carrier that your modern legacy system is forcing you to be. So evolution of core insurance technologies is core tech. Core tech is a combination of cloud native technologies implementation methodologies insur and insurance core systems that are architected for the future of, of insurance. And we believe that the architecture of core tech looks like this. Um, and this is how we actually advise our customers when they're evaluating, or our prospects, people evaluating us, how they should evaluate core systems, right? This is a let, we, we advise them to use this as a lens to layer on top of any system that they're evaluating so that they can be sure that they're not buying modern legacy, which means that they'll be back at the table in just five years, right? And so looking at the business model, ask these questions, right? Are you customer centric or product centric? So if I have a customer that has a term life policy and a, a personalized auto policy, is that one customer record or two? Can you even provide uh, personal auto and term life on the same platform? Right? Really important questions. Uh, cloud native, 
Uh, this is now this is the biggest confusion that's going on with modern legacy right now. Uh, the vendors in the market are simply taking their monolithic architectures, dropping them into a public cloud, and calling it cloud native. It's not. It's just enterprise stuffed into the cloud, not taking full advantage of the true capabilities that the cloud has to offer. So really dig in, dig into the underlying core systems architecture, not the digital veneer that's on top, because the limitations come from the core system. So that's the architectures to really dig into. Whether it's SaaS or deployed in the cloud, you still need to, to, to dig in and do your diligence. Um, so, uh, we have, we have this model uh, and uh, we're, we'll be providing it to everybody after the event, but I'm going to leave you with one final thought, right? What will you do in five years when your vendor has to rewrite their entire platform from scratch and you'll just need to do another full implementation? And that's the importance of avoiding modern legacy because the technologies are going that they were built on are going away so fast that vendors uh, with modern legacy vendors, they will have to rewrite their entire platforms from scratch. It's not an upgrade. And so in five years, six, seven years, when that happens, that means a full new implementation for you. And that's why it's really important to avoid modern legacy. Um, and, and that's why Cortec, the technologies that are designed for the platforms that are designed for the future of insurance, designed to take you from 2020 to 2030 and beyond. And like I said, we will be uh, handing out this, uh, this uh, tool uh, to help you as you go through your own evaluations. And I will be here and I will be in the networking area. Uh, would love to talk further about it, talk about modern legacy, talk about core tech, talk about the futures of the technology. So hope this was helpful uh, as you spend the rest of your day or the afternoon here talking about core systems evolutions, legacy integrations with insure tech, and realizing that there's now three, there's, there's now three different architectures, old legacy, modern legacy, and core tech. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Tony. Uh, really uh, helped lay the groundwork for today's light of discussion. So, so thanks again. Did a great job. Um, our first panel today is de-risking upgrades, how to effectively manage career risk upgrades. Um, first monitor today will be Jeff Goldberg. Jeff is the EVP of research at Novarica. His expertise includes data analytics, big data, insure tech and innovation, and software engineering best practices, Prior to Novarka, Jeff held senior roles at Salent and Marsh. Our first panelist today is Jonathan Silverman. Jonathan is a director in Microsoft Worldwide Financial Services Industry Group. Prior to Microsoft, he spent 25 years in the financial services industry at Capgemini and ENY. Next, we have Chris Vavra. Chris is a product leader for Guidewire. He's responsible for Guidewire Cloud Platform Application Integration Layer. Chris has over 20 years experience managing successful integrations and in application platforms, serving hundreds of the world's leading financial services organizations. Next, we've got Bob Pick. Bob is the CIO of Tokyo Marine North America Services, and he leads a team of 750 technical and partner resources. Bob has spent time outside the insurance as a technical, technical executive at Condé Nast, which owns Wired and The New Yorker. He is also a trustee for the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra. Finally, we have Greg Tachetti. Greg is the CIO of State Auto Insurance. Prior to State Auto, he founded InsureState, an insure tech platform for SMB Insurance. Greg has also served as senior executive at Fireman's Fund, Allianz, and Safeco. Uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, now I'll hand it over to Jeff. Hi, thanks so much for the introduction, Brett, and uh, thanks for having me to facilitate this panel. We've got four incredible panelists and 40 minutes, so I'm not going to do as much talking. I have essentially emerged from vacation for this one afternoon to join you. That's how excited I am about this event. Um, so I think uh, first, I think it was a great introduction, the, the previous talk, just focusing on some of the new drivers of core systems. Uh, and th the point of this panel is to talk about de-risking upgrades, right? It's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of 
you know, once you have a system live, there's a lot of history that goes involved that you, you have to maintain it and build it. But first you need to get it into production and that is a major, major cost and a major driver of risk uh, for uh, insurance companies. So we've got a great panel of both insurers uh, and vendors to talk about really how core system transformation works on both sides. Uh, to start, I'd like to have everybody talk a little bit about the background, their current state, what's going on, uh, and we'll kind of set the stage there. Uh, so, Bob, let's start with you. Uh, at Tokyo Marine, it's, you know, like a lot, of the a lot of the companies on the call today, you've got a long history of systems, but you also have many distinct operating companies. Uh, and that can obviously add complications to core, when you think about one core system, multiple core systems, multiple core systems talking together. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the current state of core systems uh, at TMNA and, and your, the peer organizations? Yes, yeah, certainly, thanks. Uh, for Tokyo Marine, we have a, a more than 40 operating company, companies around the globe, and they're acquired and operate largely independently. So we don't generally take, uh, undertake efforts to homogenize or consolidate core systems. Within the Tokyo Marine North America companies, namely uh, Philadelphia Insurance, uh, Tokyo Marine North America, First Insurance Company of Hawaii, and a few others, um, we've taken that approach as well. So the core systems that they operate are the core systems they operate. Um, within just our group of companies, um, we have a range of uh, uh, in the middle of being in the middle of full core system transformation as First Insurance Company of Hawaii is with Guidewire products. Um, we also have done point replacements of uh, individual core systems. But I think I would characterize um, our perspective as changing over the last two to three years. And it's too dramatic to say that the days of the giant core system replacement projects are done. But what we're recognizing increasingly is that while a core system, uh, and you know, specifically a uh, billing policy claims, uh, the big ones, um, may have been a massive differentiator in the past, it may actually not be the core focus of differentiation in the present or the future. And I should caveat to say most of our business in the, in the US um, for Tokyo Marine North American companies is, um, is commercial. And that, that is important to understand because the pace of change in personal lines, pers personal lines, property casualty is a little bit different and some of the drivers are different. So, uh, you know, among the things very quickly that we're considering are where is our investment best targeted for greatest differentiation. Sometimes it is indeed replacing a core system and, and considering uh, insure tech plays in those spaces. In a lot of cases, however, it's not that we don't believe we have some modern legacy, a bit of a dramatic term, but I, I can buy into it. But we recognize that the issue isn't standing a new system up in three months. The issue is how long does it take to get rid of the old one? And that is years and no one can tell you any difference. Um, with that in mind, between then and now, what are the things that we can do to increase our, our pace of, um, of automation, our efficiency, our user experience, and our engagement with insureds um, and with our, with our uh, agents and producers? And those things tend to take the, the form of integration, automation, user experience awesomeness, and just general connectedness from a digitalization strategy, not necessarily burning all our capital in giant core system replacements. So I'll, I'll pause there. I know we've got a lot to cover. Oh, great. That was terrific. Thank you so much. And, and yes, and I think you bring up a good point is that transformation is not the same as conversion, right? It's uh, you end, and the bigger the organization, the more legacy systems you, you might have scattered behind you, though, you know, it is important to focus on the go forward values that you brought up and not, and sometimes that means those other projects kind of get put in the closet, but not ever turned off completely. Uh, Greg, uh, my understanding is that at State Auto, you just made some significant uh, upgrades to your core system. Uh, so how has that changed the business? And, uh, you know, just as importantly, when do you think that pays off for the organization? Uh, two great questions. Uh, so I'll try to hit both of them. So yeah, Tuesday was my fifth anniversary. I came in uh, with a new leadership team to really digitally transform the whole company. And as part of that strategy, uh, we wanted to get all of our 25, 30 year old uh, COBOL legacy systems brought up to spec, so to speak. So all nine of those projects uh, are now, uh, at least the ninth of nine is code complete as of a few weeks ago. And uh, eight of the nine are in market and uh, in the process of rolling out. Over the first month or so of COVID, we finished the uh, seventh product, which is a uh, commercial farm and ranch package policy, farm auto, farm umbrella, farm property. 
uh, and just one example of the products we've put out, uh, it, it has just in the first five states was hitting, uh, just in those five states alone, record growth numbers. So it was a, an example of bringing business and IT together to solve a very defined problem and building uh, technology towards uh, addressing that problem. So all of the products that uh, we've put out have been experiencing really rapid growth. We did not, uh, to answer kind of the theme of the panel, uh, do a traditional implementation where we did a big build and then cut over with Renewal. We greenfielded each of these products, which let us uh, put new contracts in place, new capabilities in place, and then just we're letting the legacy stuff wither on the vine. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I, let me ask you a question, Chris, as someone representing Guidewire and a company that's doing core system implementations. Uh, what, how, how many of your clients are, this is their first core system up, update? Uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, obviously company, insurance companies have been investing in core systems for a long time, but you know, if all goes well, typically the people at an insurance company are only really going through one major core system transformation. Uh, I do think that clock starts to tick a little faster to the, these days where people will see more. But so how often are you coming in and you've got a team of people who've gone through it a couple, two or three times uh, versus they've been running on something since before they all were at the company and now they are for the first time dealing with a core system replacement. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's a great question. You know, I, I think reflecting on what Greg and Bob talked about as well as the, the earlier address. You know, I, I think if you go back 10 years, we, we may have seen many more of our engagements, uh, may have been with uh, insurers that were doing perhaps their, their first transformation or their first you know, significant um, uh, upgrade. Uh, we, we really don't see that uh, as much anymore, right? And I think it should come as no surprise based on the evolution of the existing, you know, legacy and new investments that happened over decades, um, there really is uh, a an evolution of of the the solutions that that insurers are are living with today and that they're that they're maintaining. So when we get engaged, you know, we're typically seeing um, that there is is definitely some some history in terms of. Uh, things that have gone well and things that haven't. Um, so for, for folks that are embarking on this, um, it, you know, I think it's uh, some of the reticence is, is, uh, uh, is, is I think, well characterized. Um, but, you know, working with folks that have experience doing this, you know, we have hundreds of, of projects under our belt um, in, in many of the systems integrators that have been doing this uh, can really help. Um, to take some of the risk out of the, mm -hmm. of the evolution. But, Great. you know, I, I think the, the shorthand is virtually nobody we work with um, anymore is this, is, is this their, their first evolution or change. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I actually like to tell insurers now is that if they're putting in a new core system today, they won't have the same core system in 10 years. It's not like you put a system in in the 70s and still we're running it 30, 40 years later. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean everyone's going to switch core systems every five to ten years. It means the uh, you know the, the way systems evolve now. If you even if you're sticking with one vendor, the system that you're using with them ten years from now will be completely different. And if it's not, if you haven't upgraded it, you've got an on-prem solution, and you uh, rather than a digital cloud version, and you haven't taken a single update so that it is in fact the same system you put in into production 10 years ago, then you probably will be looking around for a different, a different alternative. But if you're taking all the upgrades and you're, you're evolving with the vendor, uh, you know, every, every year, if not every month, uh, then you will have a different system in production. It, it'll be that boat that you've replaced one board on the boat uh, per month until it's a totally different boat. Uh, so uh, let's, let's pivot to now talking about risk more generally. And I would like to start with Jonathan. Uh, kind of from the from from not not, not someone who's selling core systems to insurers, uh, not insured, but looking at technology transformation for insurers, uh, sort of in, at a more holistic and general pro point of view. Uh, you know, as you work with insurance companies for transformation, what what is the biggest driver of risk in core system replacement or upgrades? Oh, thanks for that, Jeff. I think um, part of part of what we think about is planning. 
right? Um, have you defined your your business goals as it relates to, to this transformation? Is there a customer impact? Um, what are you doing from an employee perspective? Are you helping them to be more collaborative and to provide a differentiated customer experience, for example? So, you know, what's your strategy? Are you replacing? Are you upgrading? Are you updating? Are you enhancing? Are you breaking it into smaller pieces? You know, how are you defining success? Are you using cloud technologies? And if you are, you know, to the point that Tony made earlier, are they cloud native technologies? Are we looking at, you know, just modernizing a current system and lifting and shifting to the cloud? Two very different experiences, right? So, so part of what I think about is, you know, what are you going to accomplish? How are you planning for it? How are you going to report on the status and success? Because we don't want to be you know, five years out and going, wait a second, we were supposed to be done by now, right? And now we're looking at another two years of transformation. And then, you know, we think about software, we have to think about hardware, um, there's testing that has to be involved, right? And then there could be challenges. And I know we're going to get into some challenges a little later, but, you know, you got to think about all the pieces of the puzzle. So, you know, what about the database? Does that have to be updated? What about the data structures? Right? Are there changes there? What about, you know, continuing to gain insight into your data or enhancing the process? Right? Are you going to improve underwriting? Are you going to improve claims? Are you going to include artificial intelligence to help with um, improving the claims process, maybe shortening it, and even looking at fraud? Right? So there are a lot of pieces to the puzzle, uh, and I think it really comes down to good planning on the part of, you know, all of the people involved, whether we're talking about you know, a, a, an ISV or, or a software vendor, somebody like Microsoft who provides enabling technologies or the carrier themselves. Great, Great thanks. Chris, anything to add to that as the core system vendor, one big piece of, the biggest thing you can avoid to uh, reduce risk during uh, an upgrade? The, the, the biggest thing to avoid that, that we've seen is waiting too long between technology updates mm -hmm. um, and adopting more of a waterfall versus an agile approach, right? If, if you can, focus on the business outcomes you're trying to achieve and put a consistent investment and exercise those muscles of taking on the updates of the technology pieces, it really helps you to focus more on the actual business innovations that you want to put into the system um, in, in order to get to the business outcomes you're looking for. Does the move to a cloud native system approach and software as a service models start to get rid of some of the waiting too long to do an update uh, issues that we've had in the past? Yeah, absolutely. Um, be between a DevOps and agile mindset and leveraging you know, cloud technologies with the trusted vendor, um, it really allows you to focus on your core competence and the outcomes that you're trying to achieve um, and, and not have uh, these sort of lingering you know, big bang uh, upgrades that, that are that, that you have to deal with. Right. Uh, Greg, so having gone through an upgrade to your core system recently, uh, where did the risks come from? Did you see them inside the organization, external vendor risks? Uh, where were the, where was the major source? Uh, all of the above. You know, we, <laughs> we started as an agile or a waterfall shop and had to transformed to an agile shop and now into a cloud native uh, a CICD full DevOps shop. So, you know, that, that maturity, you know, isn't something that's achieved overnight. Um, I'd say that one of the biggest problems you run into uh, early on is really trying to define what it is you're trying to solve for. Uh, and Tony and others have kind of, you know, talked about this already. Are you just trying to get a new capability and new functionality like uh, a telematics program into market? Or are you really trying to digitally transform your whole enterprise? And you got to really start there. A lot of times the business executives that are making the decisions, you know, feel like a system is going to fix all of the problems in the world. When really these big monolithic applications have been built over decades and provide a ton of functionality. And therein lies the problem. It's not documented and you don't know what you don't know until you start digging into it. So like I said earlier, what we did, rather than even try to crack that nut, we just greenfielded and, and, and pivoted away from the whole legacy product. Uh, and that was the major way we de-risked. I'd say the other two things that you really have to focus on are getting the design. I think someone said that earlier, maybe Jonathan, uh, the design and the plan right up front. 
and then uh, uh, really going fast and, and keeping the scope tight. Uh, one of the things we did well at times and not well in, in the very beginning uh, is we call work backwards. So design almost your end user experience in mind up front and then make sure the applications and, and systems that you're building will support that. Otherwise, you end up with bad data models and all kind of database problems that uh, will continue to be your new legacy issue. Great, thank you. And we actually have a question from the audience for Bob that I think actually really piggybacks well on something you just said, Greg, which is, Greg, you talked about focusing on business outcomes rather than the systems or technology themselves. And uh, someone from the audience had asked uh, about, Bob, you mentioned that billing and policy systems are not your core differentiators. Uh, and so I think my, my feeling is that that's probably aligned with what Greg just said about it's about the business outcomes. It's not necessarily about the systems themselves, but uh, I just thought maybe a good chance for you to kind of talk about that for a moment. Uh, what do you, what do you see as the core differentiators and does that, you know, to try to tie it to the topic, does that change the nature of how you manage risk when you focus on what, what you see as core? Yeah, the, the core, the concept of a core system really just boils down to it's a bucket of functionality that was conveniently thrown in and then software vendor after vendor replicated that essential group of functionality and called it this one is billing, this one is policy, this one is claims. But the reality is that across many carriers, the functional leakage across systems is, is wide and, and really they're just buckets of functionality. The key is how we're delivering business. Um, and how we're approaching those who we serve and those who are uh, employed in the company to serve insureds and, and our, and our uh, uh, producer partners. Um, the biggest problem, frankly, that I think we see, and we don't, blessedly, we don't have too many, or uh, really any uh, ancient uh, green screens uh, uh, <laughs> systems. They're really all this century. Um, and most of them are even within the last 10, 12 years. So we don't have our problem is not legacy, legacy, if we're using the Tony's nomenclature, it's modern legacy. But the primary problem is data. And the primary problem is that taking the policy administration system example, it's not the pass, it's the insurance products on that pass. So you can't just say, okay, we're going to swap out the functionality and you just, you know, pick up the products and you you have a carrier pigeon, drop them in a new system. Oftentimes you need to transform the insurance products themselves. You need to refile. You need to think about, uh, you know, in the PMC world, your ISO or AIS um, currency and those sorts of things. And then you're basically creating a new product in a new system and you're running off the old product in the old system. That's complicated stuff. Um, and if you don't take a business focused approach then you end up in a technology nightmare. So I completely agree with Greg, with what Greg said, and I think they're, they're further along in a lot of ways than, than we have, but that transition to Agile, Agile is a, is a method, not a goal. CICD is a method, not a goal. Cloud is a method, not a goal. But all of those methods tend to come together in something that allows us to be more business focused than just mired in the technology. And I think that's that's a key way uh, to keep a project successful. The differentiators that we see aren't exclude, they don't exclude billing policy claims, but they tend to be more focused on that user experience. What is efficient? How do we improve integrations? How do we make an awesome user experience? How do we improve time to market, time to change coverages, time to deliver a policy, time to settle a claim, all those sorts of things. The tech on the back end, it's not that it's incidental, it's just that it's, it's, it's on the back end. It's not really what we're focused on daily. Okay, great. Great, thank you. Uh, we had a great uh, question come in. I just wanted to know about customizations versus configurations. We're going to address that when we get uh, to a little bit later when we talk about mitigating risk. So I will, I have, a, I'm acknowledging it and letting you know we will talk about that. But uh, next on the agenda today, we want to talk about challenges and project setbacks. These are major projects. Uh, they take, they can take a long time. Uh, and, uh, you know, but you often need to keep going. Uh, so uh, let's start with Chris. Uh, when you're working with an insurer to, to put a core system into, into production or upgrade a core system, do you have early warning signs that something's going to go wrong uh, that you look out for? And how do you address those? How do you address setbacks and how do you prevent setbacks from happening in the first place? Sure. So, you know, I think IT leadership, um, having trusted partner um, has already been addressed. Um, I think a, a really important thing is having the proper business leadership. Um, with any major IT project, 
with the level of complexity of core systems and everything that they touch. Um, you're going to have to, when you, you make a transformation or you make some sort of upgrade, make certain trade-offs in business function. And it may be, um, hey, if we leverage the system the way it was, it was already designed, we can save some time here and get to the outcome more quickly and focus on something that has more business benefit. But if you don't have a business leader that can see and make the proper judgments um, and you know, may, may take more of an approach of not wanting to get into the details of how to break down uh, the problem in partnership with the, the IT and the delivery team of how to roll that out um, over stages as a successful project, um, you can see that you're going to run into scope creep and way too high of expectations on the business side. And, you know, the perception of how these projects go um, is the reality of the outcome, right? right. So having a, a business leader that can, can balance the IT constraints and how those uh, pieces are rolled out and be able to get alignment with key business stakeholders so that the right trade-offs are made to maximize the project um, is, is critical. When, you know, when we, we, we don't see that, obviously we work closely in partnering with the insurer and all the stakeholders involved, right? And bringing our uh, folks to bear um, that can share their stories. Um, but also the systems integrators are, are key and we work um, in alignment with them um, as well as with the insurer directly. Right. Great. So Greg and Bob, uh, Chris just talked about some things that were really cultural, business, business stakeholders uh, pushing for change uh, and, and driving these things. How do you overcome organizational inertia and organizational culture to get, uh, to get everyone to think agile, to think about rapid deployment and, uh, and to avoid falling into some of those traps that Chris just mentioned? I can tell you what we did starting five years ago, and I'd been almost 30 years in the industry between Geico and Safeco, and traditional steering committees that met once a month or once a quarter with a bunch of vice presidents in a room, and you know you deliver something three years later and you say, it's not what I wanted. So we, we tried to do everything differently. We got rid of steering committees. Uh, I would go to the weekly stand-ups or daily stand-ups until we kind of figured out that you know, they had the right pace and right decision-making. Business was dragged in from the, the jump. So there really was a very tight integration. Uh, our SI at the time was Deloitte for the first set of products, and we moved to Cap Gemini for a lot of the commercial products. So the SI comment I agree with. The partnership is a word we use all the time. But uh, as I said earlier, really the velocity, getting the scope right and getting the velocity up uh, is key to success. And, and having those visualizations, those screens that your business partners can look at. You know, there's a whole lot of plumbing that needs to go on behind the scenes to be able to get that screen to function the way that they want it. But if they don't, if you don't have that simulation build up front, you know, you, you might be working towards the wrong target and that's when you start having, like our first product took 13 months to go live and it was pretty much what we wanted because we designed it before we started. Yeah, and, I, and I, I would follow up on that exactly in agreement that if you if you focus on the plumbing, then every, number one, everyone gets painfully bored. But number two, you lose sight of the vision. And, and I agree, we're a shared services company uh, within Token Marine Group. So we service multiple different group companies, each one successful, each one with a very different business culture. We have those that absolutely embrace that partnership where it's a business project powered by IT. And then we also have group companies that view everything as an IT project and they're, you know, the degree of reluctance of engagement varies depending upon the topic. But the more you can tend toward, this is a business project and IT is just a, uh, an active uh, participant moving along with everybody else is, is key. The other thing I, I'd throw out, and I think it is a challenge for anyone moving from the, the modern legacy or legacy legacy is, um, if the, the vision is you're just replacing tit for tat, you're replacing existing functionality with new functionality, or worse, you want to recreate your old functionality in your new system, it not only is that fraught with danger, it is inevitable failure. And I'll say, you know, we've been around that bend before, 
where you take a new system live and it's great, it costs a lot of money and it works, but it's not exactly what you wanted because you realize you created too much of the old, recreated too much of the old system in the new system. Yeah. So taking advantage of whatever product it is, whether it's an insure tech that's two years old or whether it's a guide wire that, that has been in the, in the game for 20 years, take advantage of what they've learned with all of their implementations and go out of the box as much as you can and focus only on those areas that truly differentiate your business as it relates to your core system implementation. That's great. And you just really answered the question that came in earlier about taking a vendor platform as is or trying to custom build it. Uh, yeah, it's, and I, I think, that is absolutely the correct approach. It's it's really, it, but it does require some organizational trust and culture to say, look, we're not like telling people that you're not going to rebuild their current pro, uh, way of doing things is it, a struggle, right? You have to, it means everyone has to relearn, not just the system, but how they think about the business process. Uh, and so I, but I I, I'll tell you, you cannot overstate that problem, right? Because most people have been working in a system and that's their understanding of how insurance works. And, you know, there's different companies do things different ways. And I've had the benefit of sitting in a bunch. And when you start talking to people and they well, look, that's not right. What you just said is not actually the insurance law. That's just how state auto did it. Uh, it's, a, you know, a, a tough conversation for people to have because, you know, after 20 years, that's all they know. Yep. Yeah. And that's how they, that's how they learned the industry. So that right. is a, it requires some top down, uh, you know, guiding principles and support to make sure that people understand they're going to have to change. Uh, Jonathan, and really anyone, uh, but Jonathan, let's start with Jonathan. You've been talking a little while because uh, I haven't asked you questions directly. Uh, do you have any examples of, uh, of setbacks, of, project, of, of overcoming project challenges when you've been working with insurance companies that you can share with us? Sure, and I, I'm going to build off something that everybody else has said, right? Um, we're trying to solve a business problem, <clears throat> and, and the business um, doesn't really care about the technology. They care about the solution and, and those business outcomes, right? So I think it's really important early on that you align business and IT because IT has to support this environment, right? So if the business, and this happened once where the business started doing an upgrade on their own, um, they didn't engage uh, IT as early as they needed to, and there were some database migration challenges, and the business doesn't have that skill set. So, you know, one of the challenges I would say that, that's really critical is that um, everybody's got to get involved. And, and, you know, both Greg and Bob said this, right? IT and the business have to be walking hand in hand. We have to understand what the goals are of the business. And then IT has to help use technology to enable those solutions, right? And Guidewire has a great solution. We've got a lot of um, partners, you know, core system partners that, that have their solutions both on-prem and, and in the cloud, but they've got to be such that if you're moving from a legacy environment to, you know, something newer, right, that you've thought about all of the different challenges and upgrades that have happened over time. That's one of the reasons why I like software as a service. Um, if, if you can take that core system and move it into a cloud native solution, right? And all of, all of our partners, including Guidewire, have this. Um, then, then you can make it a lot easier to maintain that system. You don't have to do these regular up, upgrades and you don't have to do all this customization, right? Customization creates a lot of risk as well, right? So I think it's really important that everybody be working together and not just solving the business challenges, but those are the drivers, but there are technology challenges that we have to, to, to deal with. And the older the systems are, um, the more difficult those challenges might be. Okay. Any other specific examples uh, of, a, of, a, of a project challenge uh, that someone's run into during a core system upgrade? <laughs> no one wants to share the bad. The bad. <laughs> All right. All right. That's fine. Um, so we, we actually have had a couple, two really interesting questions coming in that I'm going to merge into one. Uh, so one question about APIs and the importance of them and having engineering really making everything API accessible. And another about low code, no code systems, uh, the kind of uh, digital experience platforms, but not necessarily a full core system. And so I'm going to ask, is there some alternate approaches to thinking about core system 
uh, replacement and upgrades that are emerging in the, today's marketplace. Could you have a really API-enabled background, backend or even microservices backend where you build a more nimble front end using a, a low code, no code platform on top of it, rather than the box core systems that we sometimes talk about. I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Uh, assembly of systems, and I, you know, I've been in insurance now for seven years, but as mentioned, I had a couple other industries before this. And I'm a big believer in assembling, not building. Um, and increasingly, I think this is possible and in, in, in a, an increasing number of cases, preferable. Um, in the core systems context. And I'll, I'll use the example, one of our group companies has a, um, a legacy um, policy admin system that needs to be modernized, but it's, it's supported, it's updated, it's patched, it's not floundering in the background, it's mainstream technology. Um, but one of the thoughts there for an interim, we still wanna eventually go to a new policy admin system, but there's an interim period of years where you're gonna have a couple. Um, is uh, to uh, finish up some API, API enablement of that. And perhaps even when you think about it, um, there's some features, some things it does really well, and there's some things it needs some help with. How can we assemble, wrapper it, so we get more value out of it now, and it facilitates achieving the differentiating goals that we have of digitalization and better engagement and integration and all that, while we're also solving for moving to either upgrading it to that, that particular uh, uh, vendor partner's uh, newer system or whatever it is. Um, it's those types of things where you can assemble things together. Now, I don't think it's, it is fraught with danger to try and assemble and roll your own policy admin, your own billing system, though that can be done. But it, it, we don't have to think of it in terms of poor monoliths. There is a lot of overlap in these Venn diagrams, and that's okay architecturally, especially in interim states between where we are now and where we want to get to. Yeah, I can't possibly agree more. We, uh, uh, over the last nine months, have been on a journey to rebuild a lot of the integrations that we built even over the last five years and turn those into serverless uh, APIs microservices. Uh, to give you one example, we externalized ratings. We had a tool uh, in, in the monolith where uh, actuaries would take down and run new modeling pricing scenarios and run a thousand policies to see what the, the algorithm change would do with existing policies. And that would take about 11 minutes in the existing new architecture uh, to run those thousand policies. When we rewrote those services with microservices, that thousand policies now is 200 milliseconds. So it's one of those examples of better, faster, cheaper. We're all in Amazon, so uh, I don't need to buy big CPU chips to run the, those, the, you know, crunch those algorithms and that, those big data packets when I'm using serverless microservices. So that saves me money and it's faster. Uh, so that's the, the path that we're on right now. We just went live with, uh, I think we're the first carrier on Bold Penguin's platform. It's a uh, commercial, small commercial platform using just uh, microservices and API. A lot of people are using APIs, but uh, true microservices. All right, great, wonderful. And so we're actually we're at two o'clock. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna give you one more question since we started a little bit late. Uh, and uh, it's let's talk about teams for a little bit. Uh, and do we have to be rethinking the talent and uh, the people who work with us, both from our internal staff and our players, what new skills uh, are required uh, as we approach the future? Is it, is it a cultural shift or is it really about to training a new generation of, of technology, technology people who understand how to do things differently? I mean, I would argue it just at a macro level, uh, insurance people need to become technologists and technologists need to become insurance people. And it really is that simple. We can talk about hot skills and interesting things. And that's always, there's always hot skills in tech. And frankly, there are hot skills in, in uh, you know, insurance business as well. But, you know, one of the things that we, we use is our little moniker, we're not information technology, we're insurance technology. And we expect our folks to, in, on an increasing basis, as, as Greg said, and same with Agile and CICD, this does not happen overnight. Our technology people need to know insurance and view themselves as insurance technologists. But as importantly, and I would argue maybe even more importantly, our business brethren need to be comfortable with the nomenclature, the language, and the operations of, in, of technology as well. Everything else kind of flows from that thinking, in my view. Great, great. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I agree. I think it's both people and culture. Um, 
we've had a, a you know foc- a lot of focus on culture over the last five years, but we're even doubling down now uh, with the assets that we have in place. We're putting a product team structure around uh, very small customer facing product teams that are led by a business person as the product owner, and then. We're bringing in, uh, I think we've hired 40 engineers just in the five months of COVID. Uh, you know, it's one of the unfortunate things that we've been able to take advantage of with a lot of talent on the street. Uh, and we're bookending that with an apprenticeship program with uh, Columbus State Community College, where we're bringing in a very diverse applicant pool that are just getting into the technology field. So pulling all those things together and with the right people and the right culture uh, focused on very discrete customer outcomes is going to be a big part of how we run the business going forward. Terrific. And Jonathan, you have something to add? Well, I, I'm going to agree with, uh, with Greg that I think it's about customer experience, right? We're moving away from being product centric and being more customer centric. So, <clears throat> you know, in, in today's day and age, especially with COVID, when we can't get in front of customers, um, we need to make these experience these experiences more personalized the same way we're doing it right now. Um, You know, how do you continue to develop those relationships and differentiate yourself as a carrier with the, with the consumer? Great. Terrific. And Chris, any last words? Just from a skill standpoint, you know, I think it's important to think about um, how you, you know, choose your partnerships with both the vendors you're working with as well as with the systems integrators, um, because there is a wealth of experience um, in, in tackling these problems. Um, and that, that three-way partnership uh, can, can, can really uh, lead to great successes and outcomes. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. I feel like this panel could have gone for another hour and it would have <laughs> remained interesting and intriguing, at least to me. Uh, but we are at time. So thanks for the audience questions and thanks for everyone participating today. Thanks, thanks everyone. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, that was uh, excellent, and yeah, I agree. We probably could have gone for a few more hours on that topic. It's uh, it's something that's at the forefront of uh, pretty much every insurance company and insure tech right now. So, thank you uh, for all your insights. Uh, it was very valuable, um, and I want to uh, remind everybody as well that uh, to take advantage of our networking meetings today between three and five, we're giving away some great prizes, including a Microsoft Surface Pro Seven, sponsored by Microsoft. Um, all you need to do is run at least two meetings between three and five, and you automatically qualify to win the prizes. So for those who do run uh, two or more meetings, make sure you drop back in around five, and Tony and I will announce the winners. Um, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Microsoft Surface Pro, here's a little more information for you. All right, now, uh, All right, up, now next, up next, we have our second, second, have our head, second talk head Talk of the Day. Uh, top five uh, challenges, top challenges integrating with legacy systems. I can't think of anybody to speak on this topic better than Michael D'Augusta, a good friend and contributor of InsureTech New York. Michael is a serial entrepreneur and CEO of Clarion Door. He's a self-proclaimed font hipster and blogger, Stanford-educated technologist with senior roles at Choice Point and Steel Card prior to Clarion Door. Thanks for joining us today, Michael. Please take it away. Great. Thanks for having me. Share my slides here again. Cool. Cool. So great to be with you here today at InsureTech New York. Um, so here to talk about top five challenges integrating with legacy systems. And I'm sure we all have our own mental image. We hear the term legacy, uh, especially when it comes to technology and insurance systems. I mean, it's possible you might think trust and reliable, and sometimes that's true, 
but it's far more likely you'll think an old, slow, stubborn roadblock. And if you're an insure tech, you probably think, man, that ancient thing I'm forced to painfully integrate with. And it's true, right? But there's something even worse than integrating with a legacy system. It's trying to replace one, as you've been hearing about. Right? Insurance companies' entire technology stack is often insanely intertwined with these legacy core systems. And so playing nice with them is often the price us insure techs have to pay in order to introduce new technology to an insurer. At Clarion Door, our platform often sits in front of legacy systems, extracting out the product definition and distribution needs into our modern system, and then transmitting bound policy data into everything from old legacy mainframe systems to newer but soon to be legacy policy administration systems. So here are a few of the key challenges to be wary of when attempting to integrate modern platforms into legacy ones. <laughs> I think it's important to understand that just about every legacy application you encounter is never the actual system that the company initially purchased. Most, if not all, those systems have been butchered and bandaged so many times that they've been transformed into their own separate species of software. So even though you may think you've got some knowledge about CSEs, PMS system, or whatnot, you're likely to encounter a completely different variation of that system every time. And unfortunately, even when systems claim to use industry standards, <laughs> still tends not to be the same thing. Everyone interprets each standard somewhat differently or sometimes a lot differently. Right? So you should assume every legacy system is essentially completely proprietary to that one company. This leads directly to the second challenge. <laughs> when I worked at Apple, a coworker of mine had a great line which has always stuck with me. He came over clearly frustrated, brandishing a manual and said, you know, there are actually three completely different versions of this software. It's the one they sold us, the one I'm actually using, is the one in this documentation, and they have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> and I think about that a lot because insurers will often tell you that an interface or an API is documented. And they may honestly believe that, but you should not. <laughs> Some key questions to ask to help are, is this a new API? How many other people are using this API in production today? Can we talk to those people to see if we get some tips on integrating with that API? We find these sorts of questions will often tell you far more about how easy it's going to be implemented than what the insurer tells you to directly. If it's not a widely used interface, then expect to encounter a long list of unknowns, exceptions, and variations from the official documentation that you often won't discover until you're deep into testing. Often it turns out that the real documentation might just be one person in the IT department that can actually navigate the legacy code. Everyone always wants to know, how long is this integration going to take? <laughs> it's already an almost impossible question to answer because of the problems mentioned. There's another often overlooked aspect that can drastically affect the timeline. How is the testing going to work? Right? Not just who's gonna do it and when on what you know, environment, right? But can you hit the API in real time and immediately get back a granular error response that you know, field 17 is the wrong length? If so, you'd be able to move pretty fast. If, however, you can only submit one file per day and the only result you get back is file failed, <laughs> it's going to take forever. <laughs> Just the nature of the beast. That cycle time really matters. So it's very important to establish early on how is that cycle going to work? And there's anything that can be done to make it shorter because so much of this ends up being trial and error, unfortunately. <laughs> Even setting the customization problem aside for a moment, most of the data structures with legacy systems are just difficult to navigate in general. They were typically only designed to work for that system and often were never intended to be exposed externally. externally. This leads to multiple challenges. First, sometimes just outright noise. We looked at a rating API for an allegedly modern system. Right? The rating algorithm in question required about 40 data fields. The rating API they gave us was 20,000 lines long. It was basically just every field in the whole system's data model, claims, brokers, you name it, right? Up to us to figure out what goes where, you know, it's just that happens sometimes in these APIs. Second, the legacy system API often exposes data in a way that follows the structure of that legacy system. What you get isn't a modern business-oriented API where you can say, hey, I want to do this business transaction. Right? What you get instead is what we think is a screen-based API, 
we can almost see the screens behind each API call, right? And what should take one API call actually takes seven as you can click through the screens of the legacy system. And all the seven API calls have to be orchestrated. So I'll create account, then do this, and then do that, right? It's not really a business API that you're working with. Lastly, the legacy system's data model can be so peculiar, it can push your data model to align with it, lest you can't do the integration at all, right? Oh, you know, we store this data field at this level, not that level, and this goes over here, and we need to know how this maps to that. It's very important to do the work to abstract that out, even if it means having a more complex translation layer. Because otherwise, the legacy data model's poison will essentially flow downstream and corrupt your system's design and implementation. The bottom line is API enablement is unfortunately often a facade. Vendors do it, insurers do it, and they say, hey, now we have an API, and they tick that box. Whether anybody's using it or not, no matter what the API looks like, they've got APIs, it's all the same, right? Those systems weren't truly designed and built to be API first, and that means it's never the same. Yeah, it's a lot like people saying, uh, oh, we're cloud now, <laughs> when really all they mean is they're hosting the same old servers just further away. That's not too cloud, true cloud. So lastly, unfortunately, there's something else that legacy systems often have an undue influence on, <laughs> the organizations that use them. Many organizations have really spent decades creating processes built around how those legacy systems happen to work. So when any new technology is introduced to the organization, the first thing they often do is try and mold that solution to fit those processes. That's how we do it here. That's how we need to do it here. Right. Next thing you know, you've recreated the same old legacy approach just with a newer veneer. And this is when you really need to get creative and educating the client and working with the client and how they can do things better, what has been successful for your other customers and so on. That modernization isn't just about technology, it's about business process as well. The client is unwilling to reevaluate those procedures and even if technology works, progress and innovation will not have actually occurred and ultimately your solution will be disappointment. So clearly the goal of any insure tech shouldn't be to just make it across the implementation integration finish line to declare victory, right? It should be to actually make an impact on the business itself. So there you have it. Treat every legacy system like the proprietary system. Just assume the documentation is probably wrong, at least in some places. <laughs> really try and minimize the cycle time of a test run on integration. Don't let that legacy system corrupt your system. <laughs> and don't let the legacy business process dictate your business process. So I hope you found that helpful. Uh, if you have any questions about this or about Clarion Door and the impacts we've made with insurers of all sizes, brand new, so the biggest in the world, please feel free to reach out to me, Michael Augusta at Clarion Door. We also have Pat McCall, Jason Rowlison, Spiro Skias online here and available to meet as well. Or you can obviously track us down on LinkedIn and the web or anywhere else. Thank you very much. That was great, Michael. I really appreciate that and uh, for uh, sharing some of your learnings and insights. Um, and uh, up next, uh, we do have our final panel where we will be discussing Legacy Plus InsureTech, the checklist for integrating the InsureTechs. Uh, we're very fortunate to have David Bradford moderate today. David specialized in cyber risk and insurance as an analyst, an advisor, and co-founder of Advisin. Today, he's an advisor to InsureTech and information technology companies. And now I'll hand it over to David to introduce the next panel. Great, thank you, Britt, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to start off with a, uh, with, a, with a little bit of a discussion about um, um, today's InsureTech revolution re relative to the, uh, uh, to the history of InsureTech re revolutions. So if we have the slides, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, the first InsureTech revolution, believe it or not, was at the uh, turn of the 20th century. Uh, and this is, this is the Holrith machine. This is a machine that was invented in 1888 by Herman Holrith, specifically to conduct the 1890 census. So it was commissioned by the U.S. Census Bureau because there was just simply too much data by 1890 to tabulate by hand. It's very successful. So Holrith took his uh, machine to the commercial marketplace, <coughs> excuse me, and unsure as to whether there was going to be a, uh, a commercial application, if anybody needed the massive com computing power of his machine. 
But as the insurance industry that saw this and, and seized upon this opportunity, life insurers were going through their own big data issues at that point in time. And for the big life insurers, they simply had too much data to tabulate by hand and couldn't do the actuarial analysis on it. So they were all over this machine. And not only were they the first customers, um, they were also uh, major contributors to later uh, uh, versions of, uh, of this technology. So if we jump ahead to, to 60 years later, uh, in a remarkably similar image here, uh, we have the IBM 650, IBM's first commercially viable mainframe computer introduced in 1954. Um, and the 650 was, 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 was transformational at its time, but IBM believed that the worldwide market for their computer was about 50 customers. Um, as it turns out, is the most successful computer of the 1950s, and they ended up selling close to 2,000 of them. And who was at the lead? Uh, once again, it was the insurance industry, it was the life insurance industry. And the very first uh, 650 was installed at, at John Hancock Life. Once again, insurers had a huge data problem, and they seized upon the new technology to help them to corral it. So let's jump ahead to today, 60 years later yet. And obviously we have been through an enormous transformation um, in, in IT technology. Um, and there's more power in my, uh, in, in my mobile phone in my pocket than would be in a room full of 650s at this point in time. But still, this is, a, this is an ad taken more or less from random, a, uh, a, a job posting from an insurance company. Um, un, unexceptional um, in, uh, in, in every sort of way, except for the fact that if you notice, you know, we're talking about um, this, person joining the cyber life team, so presumably a, a modern forward looking product, but sort of the key qualification here is that they have to have two to four years of mainframe programming experience in COBOL. So a, a, a language is introduced in 1959 is still viable um, in the insurance world today. And you know, insurers aren't necessarily unique in that respect. There's certainly plenty of insurance companies who are still running a large part of their operations on their mainframe computers. We've been talking about that through the day. Um, so the real challenge at this point in time is to be able to take a, um, a you know, systems that were based on what at the time was leading edge technology, um, but have become institutionalized to the point that it makes it difficult to advance. But the, the, the takeaway though, is that the insurance industry really does have innovation in its DNA. And it's been at the forefront of IT revolutions for the last 120 years. Um, the challenge that we have at this point in time is to be able to, um, to, to leverage the old with the new. And from the insurer standpoint, the curious standpoint, you know, they certainly need to be thinking about how they integrate um, the new technology into their, uh, into their systems. But also from the standpoint of the insure techs, thinking up front as to how they can really make the process easier and to be able to deploy their technologies most efficiently within a world of mainframes and, going to, and uh, legacy systems and what's going to continue to be a world of legacy systems. So we want to pick up um, from where the, uh, the last panel left off and talk about some of the um, uh, some of the key things that um, we need to be thinking about in terms of both integrating the systems, but also what the opportunities are for both um, for both insure techs and from from carriers to be able to to really make these sorts of transitions work well. And I have a great group of uh, speakers here, and um, rather than me sit here and read their their biographies, I, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So, Don, maybe you can start for us. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Don Nash. I'm an executive at EY, been covering digital for just over 20 years, um, specifically focused in insurance since 2005. Um, I predominantly focus on the front of customer experience, strategy, and design, um, and appreciate being here today. Thanks, Don. And Chitan? <clears throat> Hi, this is Chaitan Kandari. Um, I'm the Chief Digital Innovation Officer at Nationwide. I've been in Nationwide about 15 years, have a lot of background in uh, core systems modernization. In fact, um, for the last probably eight or 10 years, been doing a lot of that till I took my new role. Great, thank you. And David? Hi, I'm David Kelly. I'm the founder and architect of Bob Track. Uh, Bob stands for Book of Business. We're a book of business management solution for carriers and brokers. Uh, prior to founding that, I uh, was a system architect in the incentive compensation management space where I had to design and implement dozens of large book of business management systems in order to allow the commissions and bonuses to be calculated. 
And I'm the author of the book on incentive compensation management, which is the only practical book that I'm aware of on the systematic implementations of replacing those systems in the enterprise. I'm very happy to be here. Great, thank you, David. So let's get started by talking about why should uh, carriers consider an insure tech integration. David, let's start with you. Uh, you are the insure tech representative on the panel. And acknowledging the fact that insure techs are a varied group of companies and really deal with every aspect of the insurance value chain, can you kind of distill it down and, and tell us what you see as the primary value that insure techs can, can bring to an existing core system? Yeah, sure. Um, I see it in two or three different pieces. One is just the technology piece. You know, science marches on. Uh, we get better at things, better at building software systems. We have better technologies and paradigms to use. Um, we've got new technologies like cloud services, you know, blank as a service, uh, cheap and essentially unlimited processing and storage that we didn't have years ago. Uh, focus on mobile and a focus on modern user experience. So the technology, even just, you know, bread and butter stuff is better than we used to be. So that's, that's a positive. Um, more interestingly, though, the insurance business has changed. You know, the, the way insurance is sold today is different than it was five years, 10 years ago, or 30 years ago when that mainframe system was, was implemented. You know, on-demand insurance, self-service, you know, where people can go on the interwebs and, you know, buy themselves coverage. That just didn't exist. And a lot of that stuff won't fit in legacy systems. Um, you can drop in a new small system just to do that part of your business, or you can try and look in terms of how do we build the core systems to do old school business and new school business. And, you know, that's a, that's a big decision. It's a big challenge. And, and there's also no guessing what it's going to look like in the next five years. So how flexible yet powerful can we build a system? And finally, I think that the, one of the big differences is an analytics focus. I mean, once upon a time, data lived in its system and it wasn't a big, a big priority to get that in front of people. But now every row of data can tell an underwriter of, of claims person, you know, fraud analyst, it, they, all of that information is necessary and useful in order to be able to do their jobs. And now modern systems, I think, are really much more focused on how do we make that data accessible? Thank you. And Chayden, you, you work for a large carrier. Uh, what do you see as the most promising opportunities for working with InsureTechs? And, and, and what sort of value do you see them bringing to expand or maybe even completely replace your existing platforms? Yeah, so, so thanks, David. Uh, you know, from my perspective, you can probably kind of bucket the answer into three categories, right? The value that I see is one about acceleration. And so it's really about how can you get to your business outcomes faster, right? We need to make sure as an insurance carrier, we are clear about our competitive advantage and be core and focused on that one. However, we need a lot of products and technologies to bring those competitive advantage to bear. And speed is a new currency. With speed being the new currency, you really need to make sure you get the acceleration. And that's one of the primary factors. The second that I think about is sometimes you need solutions for the short term. You need solutions that somebody else has become better at and for the short term. So why not take advantage of the research somebody else has done? Why not take advantage of the solution in your short term that somebody else has already done and you've got economies of, they've got economies of scale because they're looking at the best of that solution for multiple carriers, but it's not your core advantage, not your strategic advantage. So why don't you kind of put that in there? So the first one's acceleration. The second is you might just need things for, for the short term. And in the short term one, there's a little bit about experimentation, really test and learning things as well. And I would say the third one that to me is probably where you might actually be able to actually do things for a strategic advantage, but have what I consider a mutually agreeable kind of um, best of both worlds. So where both the insure tech and the carrier or the large scale enterprise can win by taking advantage of the scale a Fortune 100 company can bring, whether it's through distribution or those kind of customers and what a startup can bring or a insure tech can be bring, which could be specifically 
the speed or decision velocity relative to a few things. And so, and, and, and I'll give you some examples out there, right? Got, I won't go a lot, but you've got examples who do things around water mitigation. You go things that they're especially an experts in that. How do you bring that into your customer journey uh, process to, to take advantage of? So those are the three that I would say, David. Great, thank you. And you raise a couple of interesting issues that we'll come back to later in terms of the speed and the velocity of, of bringing solutions to the marketplace and how that works into sort of the traditional um, uh, way of doing business for insurers. But before we, we get to that, Don, let me um, turn to you and, and ask you how E why evaluates insurance tax for the potential value that they, they could bring to insurers. And um, it's sort of a corollary question around that is, have you seen a change in, in insure tax in, in recent years in terms of the sophistication, in terms of maturity, um, you know, even today compared to say two or three years ago? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You know what, I will start off just by reflecting on how Chayton and David were speaking just to, you know, three years ago, our industry looked very different, right? In terms of the talent that we were attracting and retaining and how we were applying technology and platforms. Um, so I really do think that the value proposition that InsureTechs bring to carriers needs to evolve because, you know, many carriers have changed and the pace of that change is increasing as Chayton was talking about acceleration. So I just think it's really interesting that the, the industry, I feel I was working in three years ago is very different than the one that is today in, in very, very exciting ways. Um, so to answer the question around EY, right? We, um, we have a lot of breadth and depth in the industry. And I'd say the first thing we look at um, you know, we have a, a system and an inventory of thousands, and we are right now focused on about 700. So we, we have a process to kind of evaluate um, contacts that come our way. But I'd say the first thing is like, are they solving a big, hairy problem or a little problem? And how we're able to kind of assess that fact is we have our insurance offering leaders that are you know seasoned practitioners know the business know the technology issues and so we really look to see you know is this a really big hairy problem or is this a really cool technology um, while the latter is fun the first is what matters so we really first off look you know look to see what problem are they solving um, number two there is definitely a viability lens and you know that's the one that has probably changed a little bit more recently with the pandemic so we have to see viability in the short term we want to see scale and vision for the long term because what we don't want is to bring an interesting solution but then potentially create another risk for our carrier right because they're going to invest time resource and money in engaging, integrating, and, and going to market with the carrier. So we have to know that they're viable. Um, I'll say the, the last one I'll share is really around, are they wired to plug into the insurance ecosystem, right? Can they plug into the business process? Can they plug into the data and platform ecosystems that our carriers have both inside and outside of their enterprises? Because if not, it's not scalable and it isn't going to lead to the type of experiences, efficiency and growth opportunities that um, we're work working with our carriers to bring to bear. Great, thank you, Don. Um, Chayton, I wanna come back to uh, the comment that you made around speed and, and velocity and acceleration, which um, are obviously uh, key attributes of uh, of, of the insure tech world. Um, I've, I've been in the insurance industry for 40 years and speed, velocity, and acceleration are not necessarily terms that uh, have traditionally been applied to the insurance industry. Um, and I, I'm just wondering if there's, if there's a disconnect between what the, you know, your typical large insurer is, is used to in terms of the pace of change and the pace of getting projects done and, and, and the flexibility and, and, um, and being able to, uh, to, to, to adapt to a, a faster environment as opposed to the insure techs. And by definition, entrepreneurs tend to be fairly um, 
fairly focused on, on, on um, flexibility and, and being able to respond quickly and uh, you know, probably have a lot less um, tolerance for the, for the pace of, uh, of change in the traditional insurance industry. You know, how, how, how do you deal with these sort of different clock speeds uh, that uh, the, the parties to these, these uh, um, arrangements are, are operating under? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think to answer that, you've got to unpack a little bit, a few things in my mind. The first, you've got to unpack what really drove the, the speed or the lack of speed for the large carriers, right? And so there's multiple things over the last, I mean, you said 120 years and you set it up that way with our, uh, within, in terms of technology for insurance carriers. You got to remember a few things. The first is speed wasn't necessarily for years ago, really that of much of an urgency. The dis insurance industry perhaps was not going through a level of disruption like some of the other industries many years ago, but that's not the case anymore. There is a macro, there's a macro environment trend that is forcing us to be fast, to move with a sense of urgency. So there is a, so that's one. The next you got to unpack why we couldn't move fast is because you, we articulated up front and it was, it was earlier in today's conversation around our legacy technologies. You know, you could only move that fast. You didn't really have true continuous integration, continuous deployment type uh, pipelines. So there was a whole underpinning from an infrastructure point of view, technology infrastructure that also was inherently slow. So the one modernized applications, there was a different sense of urgency. And the third, uh, in my perspective, that you have to unpack is a decision velocity. And decision velocity, and if you think, and it's no different if you read any of the books, decision velocity in a startup, you don't need to go up eight levels, come down eight levels. And, and every question you have doesn't go up and come down. And if you put that on a graph, you will see something like, by the time the question is asked, and the answer is done is that if you put time on the, on the X axis, this much time has elapsed. And so how do you shrink that decision velocity? And the way you shrink decision velocity is you have to be much, more, much clearer with your outcomes early on. And you have to provide a sense of boundaries and guide rails to teams and say, you've got to operate under these, but make the calls yourself on a daily basis. So let me bring the conversation back to, or the, the answer back to, how do you integrate the two? You have to upfront be really clear on what decisions you actually need to have made prior to even embarking on some of these. You can't operate in a way which is, oh, I'll get to that decision over a period of time. You gotta have three or four way critical decisions which are on the critical path to be able to articulate that which requires senior management attention, number one. Number two, upfront, you've got to be pretty clear on a set of outcomes, on a set of outcomes and a set of timelines. And more often than not, I have seen this time and time again, with clarity of timelines, clarity of outcomes, teams go out on a mission. I have several examples here nationwide where we've launched at least one product in partnership with actually even EY, where we launched a product start to finish, not a product actually, I would take a whole new company in less than seven months. Um, unheard of back in the day. And so I think this alignment of decisions up front, empowering the teams, unpacking the technology to a new technology environment is all that can help with this uh, need for uh, the, 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 us get to the speed that we need to get to. Great, thank you. Don, our last panel talked a bit about some of the challenges involved um, with, uh, with, with insure tech in integrations. Um, you know, certainly from the perspective of EY, you, you, you've seen a lot as well. And I'm, I'm hoping that maybe you could, uh, could add to the, the conversation there and talk about some of your experiences. Yeah, and actually several of these stories will relate to the product experience, uh, company experience that Chayton was relating to uh, with Nationwide Inspire. Um, you know, I think part of it is, um, you know, the insure techs have a focus and an enthusiasm around their particular product that has a certain breadth. And the 
the insurance carrier, in this case it was Spire, has a, a, a very broad perspective. They need to satisfy a very broad set of requirements. And I'll say it in two parts, like two parts, like what we faced, which was basically kind of getting beyond the hype and being able to have you know, deeply specific conversations on the capabilities of one InsureTech platform, how it would plug into the ecosystem and how it would fit with actually other InsureTechs because, you know, many solutions don't draw on just one, but maybe several. Um, what we found was crucial was to move quickly as, as Jayden was mentioning, you know, using DevOps and using Agile to be able to get to the point of kind of a um, in code POC, not just visual concepts, not just pretend, but real actual proofs of concepts um, so that you can get much more quickly down to where the gaps are because it's not usually a 100% fit uh, round peg, round hole, but there are some gaps and those gaps have to be filled by the carrier uh, with expertise through partners like EY, with money through their own resources to ultimately um, deliver the solution. Um, the second example I'll give is around um, roadmap alignment, so functional alignment. Um, in short text, relatively small, have to make choices with limited resources, and in this case with Spire, there was a particular functional requirement that was crucial and supported the strategy, but was farther out on the in short text roadmap. Um, fortunately, through transparency and partnership and a bit of compromise, you know, we were able to uh, reach an agreeable plan to pull that into their roadmap, roadmap, but to push some less critical functionality out because you, you just can't have it all. And um, you have to be kind of willing as partners to kind of have some tough conversations to ultimately lead to the outcomes that we were all searching for. Great. Thank you. Uh, David, uh, you know, Shaden was talking about some of the issues around uh, speed and velocity and the like, which are really uh, cultural issues at the end of the day. It's just the way things have been, been programmed in, into the system uh, within large carriers as opposed to insure techs. Um, you've had quite a bit of experience working on large scale projects. Um, could you expand on that a little bit and talk about just kind of the cultural issues involved within large carriers that need to be addressed and overcome for a successful integration? Sure. Um, I think the, the most challenging thing we face is that you've got a senior VP of innovation who wants to be innovative. And in the kickoff meeting, that person will tell you, you know, implement best practices, make us work smart, you know, don't, don't put stupid stuff in your system. And then that's the last we ever see of that person. And we deal with the ops staff who don't have the authority to make changes to the way the business is run or the business is, is administered. So you know, a year later, we're working to the, the requirements to re essentially recreate the system that is already in place. And that is a waste of everybody's time and money. On the other hand, it's difficult as a small insure tech, you know, trying to start something up to say, well, you know, the VP told us not to do that because the, the ops manager is going to say it doesn't matter. That's what my job is. And, you know, on top of that, you've got the resistance to change. And in some cases, you know, this thing is marketed as, you know, we're going to make you more efficient. What the staff sometimes thinks of is, so your system is going to take away my job, right? And you end up with, with people meeting you halfway in terms of defining requirements and not giving you all the pieces and parts that you, you need from them because they're still protecting a little bit of turf. And that's not just an insurance problem. I mean, that's everywhere. But really, everybody wants to be innovative. Everybody wants to be modern. And the ops staff knows that what they're doing is stupid. But that's the stupid thing they've been doing for 40 years. And, you know, their, their boss taught them how to do it this way. And they don't have a choice, even if they want to change things. So I think that's what, you know, the, the, the challenge for startups is you can't be arrogant. You've got to, you can't bring your Silicon Valley, hey, you know, we're all agile and flexible and we'll do the right thing at the right time with a lot of entrenched systems and, and problems that you can't just overcome with, it would be smarter to do X. So, you know, it's a sort of negative look at the, the problem, but this is always going to be the case when you're dealing with systems, the systems that people have been running for, for decades in order to make the company work, 
you know, you can't just walk in and rip that stuff out and change, change the way people do their work. Great. So the subtitle of uh, this panel is the checklist for integrating with InsureTechs. So let's wrap up our discussion with a, with a little bit of a talk around, around the checklist concept. And, and Chayton, could you, um, could you tell us what sort of the three essential items are on, on your checklist? Yeah, I'll start with where um, maybe I'll, I'll come back to the first, uh, the way I answered the first question. You know, are we going to gain acceleration? Are we going to get to our outcomes faster, right? And let's figure out that's one. Number two, who's really got the expertise? Who has, I mean, where does the expertise lie? You know, we, we cannot be always be people of, oh, we want to take the pride in building everything ourselves. We got to be able to leverage expertise and then use that to our advantage. And the third is, you know, know very crisply and clearly how what the InsureTech brings is going to move our business forward, yet we keep our strategic advantage. So that's what I'll say um, in a nutshell. Great. Uh, Don, so can you talk a little bit about some of the, the, the features of InsureTech companies that EY looks for uh, in this partners? Yep, absolutely. So I'd say first off, it's like, are they innovating in the right place, right? Is it a big hairy problem or is it a mousetrap? Um, I'd say second, do we believe in the founder or founders, right? Do, do we believe not only in their brilliance and ability to lead the firm in the short term, but really importantly, will they know when it's time to let go? and bring in the next leader to take them to the next stage. We've seen a couple in Chortex stumble by not recognizing that the guy who got them there wasn't the guy to get them to the next place, guy or girl. Um, and then of course for us, right, is working with an integrator like in EY essential to their strategy and do we see how we could bring mutually valuable propositions to our carriers. So let's, let's wrap things up with you, David. And you're, once again, you're the InsureTech uh, entrepreneur on the panel today. So um, from your own personal experience, what would you recommend to other founders uh, when they're, they're setting out to work with, with, uh, with core systems and, and large insurance companies? Yeah, um, I think the, the hardest thing for InsureTechs to recognize is that you know, no matter how brilliant and modern your system is, it has to coexist with legacy systems and processes that aren't going to go away, um, at least not in, in the project lifetime. Um, I mean, I did a, a project with a, an insurance carrier that had one critical policy administration system operating on a DB2 machine living in a closet. And nobody was allowed to go near the closet because if anybody did and that system went down, one entire line of business would be out of, out of business. And it's all well and good to say, well, you know, we should, we should look at the, the complete landscape and figure out how to modernize this and bring it up to date. But there's some things that just can't change, policies and procedures that can't change because of the way the business has been done for decades. So that's the thing I keep coming back to is, you know, again, don't be arrogant. Don't bring Silicon Valley to, you know, the, the Midwest where the carriers have been in business for a century and are, are really good at their jobs. You know, you've got to go in with a sense of compromise and, and collaboration that this is how we can get the, the ball move forward, the ball down the field a little bit. Great. Thank you. Thank you for all the other great insights uh, from, from the panelists. Um, we, we have a minute or two for questions if there's any from the audience. Um, uh, and if not, I would like to just remind everybody that we do have the uh, digital networking uh, coming up. Uh, uh, following the panel, and, um, and most of the panelists will be available for further questions if you do have them. So, if we don't have any questions from the uh, from the audience, and it doesn't appear that we do, uh, then I will thank the panelists very much for your insights. So, uh, once again, we probably could have talked for another hour on this. Uh, it's a great topic, um, but we do uh, do have to say goodbye, and I'll turn it back over to Brett. Oh, no, thank you, David. Uh, you guys did a great job and uh, tons of tons of great insights, I think, uh, for the insure techs uh, out there that are listening as well. So I really appreciate that. 